Welcome to the Palmer Seventh-day Adventist Church worship service. We're glad you're joining us. Well, this is really strange to be in a church that is empty and to be worshiping, but everything we have experienced this week is quite strange, but we are adjusting together. We are going to see what, what life brings, and as a church, we are going to face the uncertainties and the adjust, adjustments as a, a family. And so it is so awesome to hold on to the hope that while everything else changes, the one thing that never changes is our God. And I want to point you to two worship services that I'm looking forward to. I've been looking forward to this one, but two others that I'm looking forward to is the day that we gather in this place again, Lord willing, and we meet face to face for worship. Wouldn't that be an exciting time after being apart where we can gather here and worship? And the other worship service I want to think about is the one where we are face to face with Jesus Christ in heaven. And we're worshiping before his throne. And in a, a way, by worshiping remotely, it reminds us of just how this world is not our home. And we're experiencing something, something that we weren't created for right now. We were made to be with Jesus. And the separation we feel from each other is just a, a glimpse of the separation we feel right now from our Father in heaven. So there will be a day when we worship face to face and it is before the throne in heaven. But we're excited that you've joined us for our worship service here. We don't have a lot of announcements other than that I would like to direct you to our webpage. That has any communications that we've been putting out. The webpage is palmerak.adventistchurch.org. Palmerak adventistchurch.org and if you want to know anything that we're doing in response to the coronavirus or anything that's happening in the church it is up to date it is current and so go there for any announcements and let's enjoy worshiping together this sabbath welcome and join us now as we praise god together we're going to begin our um, time with you are my all in all Actually, <laughs> this is the prayer song, and we are, we are getting ready to come to God in prayer.
Our Father in heaven, we come to you humbly today, thankful for your blessings, for the blessing of life, of health. And as we face these trying times together, it helps us to look to you. And uh, you are the great physician and the creator of, of all life. And thank you for, for that and that we can trust you in all times. We pray for your special blessing on us and our community, for your watching guidance as we uh, look towards you and look towards each other. Thank you, for, thank you for community and for love and for your Sabbath. In your name, amen. Hello, everyone. We certainly live in interesting times, don't we? And you're sitting at home watching the church service, and you're probably wondering, how am I going to um, give my tithes and offerings today? And um, so we have a couple of options for you, actually three of them. Uh, one of them is online giving, and there's two ways to do that. The second one is to mail it in, and the third one is to drop it off at church. And also, if you go to our website that Pastor Ryan has put together, palmerak.adventistchurch.org, and if you go to the tab called COVID-19 Response and click on Church Online, if you go down to the bottom of that page, you will see these three options as well. Our first option is online giving. And that is an Adventist giving app. And if you go to, on your phone, you can go to the app store and actually download this one called Adventist Giving. Um, when you open it, you can select the church and then select a one-time or a recurring donation. Fill it out like you would an offering envelope and then put in your payment information and then click Confirm Payment. It's really easy. I really like this app. That's the one I use. The other online option you have is to go to your computer, online option two, and you can go to adventistgiving.org, which is the website, and you can do it on your computer. And it's, it's, you do the same things on that. Or you can go to palmerak.adventistchurch.org, our church website, and click on online giving, and it'll take you directly to the site. The next option is mailing in your tithes and offerings. On the check or the note, put a note in there that says what the offering is for. That would be really helpful. And mail it to Palmer SDA Church. PO Box 777, Palmer, Alaska 99645. Almost all of us have PO Boxes, so just remember 777 or 777. The third option is to drop it off at church. And this one, you just go to the door of the church, call the church secretary, and she'll give you these instructions. When you see her, put the check by the door and when you leave, she'll open the door and pick up the check. And this is only during the office hours, Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, from 8 a.m. to 1 p.m. And we're doing it this way so that we can do what we can to keep Carol safe. And finally, I'd like to uh, remind you of the verse in Malachi, chapter 3, verse 10. It says, bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will not be room enough to store it. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, we thank you for the blessings that you give us. And Lord, help us in our minds and hearts to be open to testing you in this one. Lord, this is a time when we need your blessings, and uh, we ask you to help us to follow this one so that we can see what that looks like to have the floodgates of heaven open. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>
down, you pick me up. When I am dry, you fill my cup. You are my all in all. Jesus, Lamb of God, worthy is your name. Worshiping with praise songs with Blessed Be Your Name. fount of every blessing. If you would like to look in your hymnals at home, number 334, please join us. Come now, fount of every blessing, turn my heart to sing thy grace. Streams of mercy never cease. Call for song of loudest praise. Teach me ever to adore thee. May I still thy goodness prove. While the hope of endless glory fills my heart with joy and love. Here I raise my ebony. By thy help I come, and I hope by thy good pleasure safely to arrive at home. Jesus sought me when a stranger, wandering from the fold of God, he to rescue me from danger interposed. Oh, 
children, we would like to invite you to come to your screen so that uh, we have a special children's story today. I know it's special because my Nina is giving it, but not only that, it's special because you're watching from home, so that's kind of neat and different. So come gather around, and we're going to have our children's story. Happy Sabbath, boys and girls. I'm so glad that you've come to listen to this children's story. Now this event happened about six years ago when I lived in Florida. Now when I lived in Florida, I started doing Irish dance and by the time I was about 10 years old, I had gotten so good at Irish dance that I was going to be able to be in a show. But there was only one problem. All, most of the shows um, that my Irish dance school had were on Sabbath. But then something happened. We went into class one day, and as we were warming up, my teacher made an announcement that we were going to have a show on St. Patrick's Day. And she told us that the show was going to be on a Sunday. And I was so elated because finally I was going to be able to be in a show, and a big show at that, because the St. Patrick's Day show was the most special show of our school year. And so in the next, in the week's, after that, up to St. Patrick's Day, we were getting ready and practicing and practicing for our show and getting all of our dances ready. And then something else happened. We went into class um, about a week before St. Patrick's Day and the teacher had an announcement. But this time it was bad news. She said that it was probably gonna be raining on St. Patrick's Day. And since the place we were gonna have the show at was outdoors, we probably would have to cancel the show. But she said they wouldn't cancel the show until the day of. So we still had some time and I knew exactly what to do. I decided that I was going to pray. And so I prayed. I prayed in the car, I prayed in my bed, I prayed before I went to sleep and when I woke up and at all my meals, I prayed whenever that Irish dance show came into my mind. And finally, Sunday, March 17th, came and that was St. Patrick's Day and I woke up and what do you think I heard on my roof? Well, if you said rain, you're exactly right. I heard rain on my roof, but I didn't get worried right away because I knew that there was still time because the show wasn't until seven in the evening. So I kept praying. And then finally it was about noon and we needed to leave for the show. And it was still kind of raining a little bit, but we knew that the place where the show was was about two to three hours away, so we decided, well, the forecast might be different there and they haven't canceled the show yet. So we all got in the car, got all our stuff, and drove to the place where the show was. And when we got there, it was sunny. And I was so excited because I knew that probably they weren't going to cancel the show now. So we walked around before the show and we went to a playground, a really cool playground there. And then it was time to get ready for the show and we put on all our costumes and got our hair all fixed. And then we had the show and it was an amazing show. And then afterwards we got all our stuff off and we we're getting ready to leave. And I was like, oh, can I go to the playground one more time? Because since it was a really cool playground, I wanted to go there as much as possible. And um, my parents said that I could go to the playground. So my dad went to get the car and we went to the playground. And as we were walking to the playground, I suddenly felt something on my nose. And I looked up and what do you think came down from the sky? Rain, again. And at that moment, I knew that the fact that the rain had stopped for my show 
was a miracle and that God had done it especially for me. So boys and girls, you must remember every time, whenever there is something that you want or need, always to pray about it, whether it's something you just suddenly decided that you wanted or needed, whether it's something you've wanted for a long time, whether it's something big or something small, you can always pray about it. I hope you've enjoyed the story and I hope to see you again soon. Bye. The scripture passage for today is from Romans 8, verses 31 to 39. Again, Romans 8, verses 31 to 39. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall we not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died, and furthermore is also risen, who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. What shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Yet in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing, shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Nothing in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Those words are awesome, and those words are true. And I want to say a message to those watching online. Normally I have inserts in the bulletin, but we don't have bulletins and inserts. And normally I have a PowerPoint you can follow along with. But today, to engage with the message, if you just look in the description box right below the YouTube video, there'll be a link there to a blog and you can share comments and engage with the message and follow along with, with that uh, blog post. And we are starting a new sermon series right now. I had a different sermon series planned that was going to begin today, but about last week, started to realize that this virus was going to change the way we do everything and impact our lives in huge ways, and it's going to be on our minds, and it's going to be the world we're living in. And so I set that sermon series aside, and we are beginning a different sermon series. And I was asking God to give me the study to to give us a theme, to lead us through this time in a spiritual way, to anchor us in God's love, and in a way that we could hold on to the truths that this time wouldn't be a retreat, but we would advance spiritually, that we would dig deeper and grow with God. And so we're beginning that message series today, and it is entitled, Separation is Natural. That's not a very hopeful reality. But that's not the good part of the message. That's just the reality we're going to start with. Separation is natural. You've seen this printed on labels before. You've seen it on on the bottle and it'll say separation is natural. When I was in college, I would go through cafeteria at Southern Adventist University and I'd get my salad and I'd get my food. And then if I was feeling like treating myself to something really special, a real treat was to stop by the coolers and get a naked juice. There's fruit juices and it was, it was a little expensive, but it was such a fun way to enjoy some fruit. And the label of the naked juice had all kinds of exciting things, like 100% juice. And if you turned it around on the other side, you'd see incredible things they fit inside that bottle, like five and a half apples inside this bottle, or eight bananas, or 50 blueberries, or two whole watermelons, you know. And, and they, they fit so much inside this little bottle you're thinking, I, I don't have to eat for a week. Just drink this stuff. And then you see on the other side it says, 
Separation is natural. Shake well. Now there's a reason things get on labels. They think about these things. And I imagine at one point with fruit juices, somebody picked it up and looked at it, and they saw behind the label that there was separation. There was some color up here that didn't match the color right there. And they looked at it and they said, that doesn't look natural. Something's wrong with this. And the company doesn't want them to stop buying the product, so they put on the label, that thing that looks wrong, that's natural. Don't worry, just shake it up, it'll be okay. So separation is natural. And so shaking it up's not all that hard, but peanut butter is a little more difficult. If you've ever tried to wrestle a peanut butter jar to get it stirred up, you're, you're thinking, somebody at the factory tried to cut cost, and so now they're making the customer spend 45 minutes stirring this thing. But you have to do a good job, because if you don't, the first little bit will be all right, but then you'll get to the bottom and it will have hard clumps that are full of salt. So you've got to stir this. So separation may be natural, but it's not very attractive, and it's a big headache, but it is natural. Not just with juice or peanut butter, but everything in life, this side of heaven, separation is the natural tendency. Things don't tend to come together, they tend to fall apart. They don't tend to package themselves on their own in a nice way. They disintegrate. Their disorder, chaos, is the natural tendency. And so separation is natural with juices. It's natural with peanut butter. It's natural with our lives. Just think of your own experience. If you try to keep your home clean, you know that it doesn't clean itself. So we try to do things to to keep things from separating, like we have a drawer for all of our socks, and we pair our socks together, and then we have a place where we put all of our silverware, and we even have a, a row for the knives, and a row for the spoons, and a, a row for the forks, and it's all nice and tidy, and you have a box to put your kids' toys in, but life happens, and separation is natural. And so one of those socks makes it into the laundry, and the other is next to your bed on the floor. And All those nice silverwares are put there, but one day you notice that there's a fork on the windowsill. How'd that get there? And you might be watching this message right now, and you know that the toys you asked your kids to pick up are scattered all around the floor because separation is natural. You have to do something intentional to bring things together. Otherwise, they fall apart. If you've ever tried to be responsible for kids you know that separation is natural. If you've been responsible for multiple kids, you realize that they don't stay together. Chaperoning a field trip is a stressful thing. You don't want to lose someone else's kids. But I was with my three kids at the fair this past year. Just imagine you're at the fair, a busy place with kids. And I can hold their hands, but I've got three kids and I've only got two hands. And so you're walking along through the fair And one of your kids stops and you're looking at the cotton candy, which is mesmerizing for kids. It's pink, fluffy sugar. And so you're looking at the cotton candy and you say, come on, let's go. We're not getting another cotton candy. And so one of my kids is is back looking at the cotton candy, just staring at it. And we keep walking. You say, come on, come on. And I'm focused on her because I don't want to lose her. But then while I'm doing that, one of my other daughters looks ahead to the reptile exhibit And they're so excited to go, they start running ahead. Meanwhile, the other one's holding my hand and begging me to go back to the the fire department booth to get another sticker. And I'm explaining, I can't get another sticker right now because one of your sisters just ran ahead to a barn full of snakes, snapping turtles, alligators. And your other sister is back there in the middle of a path. And I got to get you together because separation is natural. In our relationships, Separation is natural. I have friends that I haven't talked to for years. You might say, well, they're not your friends. But I think of them as friends because I love these people. But time goes on and day after day we don't talk and we don't connect and we don't do anything intentional to connect and separation is natural. In marriage relationships, so many end in separation. And that's not a judgment on those who've ended in separation because in in my own, in your own relationship, if you don't do something intentional to connect and grow together, the natural tendency will be separation. And so here we are in a global virus that is terrifying and we've just been placed into a situation where there's a whole lot of separation 
that there wasn't two weeks ago. Some of you are separated from your families and they're quarantined and you're not. Some of you are separated from your work. Some might be separated from a paycheck. We are separated physically through self-quarantine and online church service and social distancing and we're separated from our entertainment and our professional sports and the concerts and the social gatherings. All of a sudden, we are very separate and if we don't do something intentional as a church and personally in our own spirituality, the natural tendency is that we will separate from the most important things in our life. The relationships God's given us, the church family. I spent my week working on a web page, sending out emails, trying my best to make the church not separate, as would be a natural thing in a time like this, to separate. But that's so important, we can't let that happen. And if you go through this, this time, the natural tendency will be your relationship with God will drift. Separation is natural. Unless you do something intentional, you will drift from the important things. And so we don't have to go through this time drifting from God. We can go through this time and grow in God. But that's what I want to spend this sermon series on, is how can we approach this time in a way that we don't give up, but we dig deep. We grow spiritually in this time. Separation is natural in our walk with God. It says in Isaiah 59, it begins with these words. It says, Surely the arm of the Lord is not too short to save, nor his ear too dull to hear, but your iniquities have separated you from your God. And we will get to the good news. That's the bad news. We've just spent our time so far on the bad, the reality that separation is natural. But before we go to the good news, some of us might just need to hear that this is natural because you thought that your spiritual struggle was specific to you and everyone else figured it out. Like that maybe you were spiritually handicapped or you had a spiritual disadvantage or somehow the other people figured it out but you just couldn't have that breakthrough in your walk with God. And so for us to realize that separation is natural means that the struggles you face are no different than the struggles that the rest of humanity faces. Our sins have separated us from God. The world pulls us away from a relationship with God. So much so that if it were up to us, we wouldn't have unity with God, but he had to send his son from out there to here. He came to us so that this natural thing could be stopped. This separation that is natural could be stopped. And so you might be thinking, something is wrong with me, but I want you, before you go there in your mind, to, to recognize if you are separating from God, that's natural. That's a normal thing that happens to all of us. You might be looking at your spiritual life and saying something's wrong, just like someone looks at a bottle of naked juice and said, that doesn't look right. Something's wrong with that. But you need to read the label and recognize that's what naturally happens. So that's the bad news. And to make it a little more complicated, not only is separ separation natural, but connection is essential. The Bible says in John 15, he says, I am the vine, you are the branches. Remain in me, he says, and you will bear much fruit, but apart from me, you can do nothing. So separation is natural, but connection is essential. And here's the good news. I'm so grateful since we naturally separate and since we need to be connected with God that our experience does not depend on what is natural, but on what is supernatural. I'm so grateful that the power that gives me life is not my own strength, but is something beyond me and bigger than me that says, even though this is natural, I can do things beyond what are natural and I can connect you to me. So the good news is that inseparable love is supernatural. Let me read the text one more time. I'm going to read verse 35 through 39, recognizing that though separation is natural, inseparable love is a supernatural reality that we are called to live in. And it says this, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are being killed all day long. We are regarded as sheep to the slaughter. 
No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Separation is natural, but our supernatural reality is inseparable love. Now, if that wasn't the case, we would be helplessly desperate when pandemics hit us. When trials come, they would conquer us. But we're in a world where separation is natural, and because of inseparable love, we can go through these trials and be called more than conquerors. So I want to spend some time in Romans 8 Going to the text, we're going to land at the very end where it says no one can separate us from the love of God. That's where we're going to end up. But we're going to take in the whole chapter mostly to get a sense for the victorious tone, the triumph, the invincibility, the sovereignty of God that is reflected in Romans 8. And so as we come to the place where we're going to dwell on the truth that inseparable love is a supernatural reality, Notice the victory in these words. I'm going to just skim over highlights of some of my favorite verses, and I'm going to be looking for the theme of sovereignty. Sovereignty is this truth that God is the supreme, ultimate power in the universe. He's not out of control. We might be out of control, but he's not out of control. No one pushes him around. He is victorious. He is sovereign. And notice this language in the text. I'm in verse 1. In verse 1 it says, There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. That's a victorious truth. There is no condemnation. It continues to say, The law of the Spirit of life has set us free from the law of sin and death. There's victory. There's control. There's sovereignty. Verse 3 tells us that Christ did for us what the law had no power to do. Verse 6 tells us that being carnally minded is death. But spiritually minded, that's life. Verse 11, the spirit who raised Christ from the dead, that same spirit who raised Christ from the dead is the spirit living in those who love Christ. That's a victorious truth. Verse 15 says that we don't have a spirit of bondage to fear, but a spirit of adoption that we can call him our father. Verse 18 is so victorious, it says, I consider that our present sufferings Our present sufferings are not even worth comparing to the glory that will be revealed. Now, apply that one to our current situation. There are some present sufferings. Paul is not claiming, and I'm not claiming, that present sufferings are little. We're comparing them to the glory of God, and in comparison, they're not even worth comparing. So we suffer and we say, you know, the present sufferings, I've lost my job, still not worth comparing to the glory of God. 200,000 plus confirmed cases, still not worth comparing to the glory of God. Whatever the magnitude of our present suffering is, however big it gets, it just reminds us that that thing is not even worth comparing to how great and awesome the glory of God is. There's victory in these words. Verse 26 says, The Spirit helps us in our weakness. We don't even know what to pray. And He intercedes for us. Verse 28 says, All things work together for good to those who love God. Verse 29 says that He predestined to conform us into the image of His Son. Right now, this very week, God is at work conforming us into the image of His Son. And then He says, after verse 29, He continues and says, For those he predestined, he also called. And those he called, he also justified. And those he justified, he also glorified. And then he gets to verse 31. In this last section that was read for us by Bonnie, verse 31 through 39 is a summary of the chapter. And when he gets here, he says, What then shall I say to these things? This is such an awesome list of truth that he comes to this point and he says, There's really no more to say. 
Well, how can you even respond to these things? So do you feel the emotion so far as he's going through this text? He's saying God is so far above any trial we have, any power that confronts us, that he gets to this point in the text and he says, what can you even say in response to this? And then Paul asks five questions after that one question. These five questions he does not intend for us to answer. They're questions that when we think of the answer, it reminds us that God is in control and no one can touch him. He's powerful beyond any power that confronts us. And so here are the questions. We will spend a little bit of time on the first four and then land on the fifth question. And he says, and it's kind of nice because the questions come, and the first question is in verse 31, second in verse 32, so it's easy to follow. So the first question is, if God is for us, who can be against us? And you can answer a lot of ways. Actually, the, the technical answer to that question is anyone can be against you. God is for you and anyone can be against you, but if they're against you, they're also against God who is sovereign. They can be against you, but they are, they are powerless to do anything because God is for you and he is in control. And so, if God is for us, who could be against us? So whatever is against you right now, whatever is against our world, whatever is suffering, size that thing up in comparison to God. Just take that thing and say, okay, this is this big. And then think of God's greatness. And in comparison, you say, who can be against me? Well, it doesn't really matter who's against me because they're against God, and that is a hopeless cause. God is sovereign. Question number two says, he who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Now the question is meant to bring to our minds that nothing can stop God from being a good giving God. We know from James that every good and perfect gift comes from, from God. And the question asks, how will he not also continue to give us all things? If he gave us his son, how will he not give us all things? And the truth is that no matter what it is, whether it's a global virus that is terrifying or a personal problem in your own home, whatever that is, God, it doesn't stop God from giving good things to you. Can't stop God from being the good giving God he is. In question number three, in verse 33, who shall bring any charge against God's elect? Now we know from Scripture that Satan is the accuser of the brethren. We know in the book of Zechariah we have this, this scene of Joshua the high priest. And Satan brings a charge against God's people. And then, and then Christ says, the Lord rebuke you, Satan. So who can bring a charge? Well, anyone. But they have to answer to God. We have a scene from Revelation. This is Revelation 12, verse 10. Listen to these words. And I heard a voice from heaven saying, Now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have come, for the accuser of our brothers has been cast down, who accuses them day and night before God. So he's still accusing day and night, but we have the kingdom and the authority and the power of our Christ. So when he accuses, he goes against the sovereignty of God. Question number four says, who is there that condemns you? And verse 34 continues and it says, Christ Jesus, who also died, more than that who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed intercedes for us. So who is there to condemn you if the one who's risen is your intercessor? Remember verse 1 of the chapter. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ. The honest answer to that question is, the ultimate one who condemns in the universe is actually God. The devil can't condemn you. Condemnation is at some point, God will say, if you don't want me, you don't have to have me. And I will judge justly. And I want those who come to me. And he condemns. God is the one who makes the judgment. Satan is not in charge of condemnation. Isn't that good news? So the one who ultimately condemns is the one who is on your side. The one who's for you. So Satan comes with accusations, but he has no power to condemn. And then question five comes. 
Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? I want you to notice the question. We focused on the word separation because separation is natural, right? We've been thinking these thoughts. But notice what it's talking about being separated from. Because we could read this and think, oh, that's good. I can hold on to Jesus. I can do this. But it doesn't say no one will separate you from religion or your efforts or trying hard not to give up or your persistence. The object is the love of of Christ. That's the thing in the sentence that has the holding power that can keep us going. It doesn't say, who shall separate you from doing good things? Who shall separate you from going to church? Well, we saw this week that that things can change and, and you're separated from these things. The only thing that you can say this about is something that will last forever, something that's eternal, something that has power. And so he says, who shall separate you from the most awesome eternal thing, the love of Christ? The question, the point, is about God's love. And we so easily read Scripture and make it about us. To make it about me would say, okay, I'm going through a hard time. I need more faith. I shouldn't let anything separate me from God. That's making the text about me, right? But the text is not saying you need greater faith. The text is saying he has great love. The focus is not on you trying to hold on to not be separated. The focus is saying that nothing has the power to separate out of the love of Christ. So it's love that's the hero of the text. I want you to stop and think about this reality. We're going to go through the rest of the text. But if it's true that nothing can separate you from the love of God, then right now, while the world is in chaos, God is loving you. What is God doing right now? He's loving me. What a thought. He could be so distracted. You've heard people talk about prayer this way to say, you know, I don't want to bother him with my prayers. He's busy with all these other things. You know, that that way of talking. You could think that way in this virus. You could say there are so many urgent things. I mean, God's got people with canceled flights to worry about. He's got general conference session delayed. He's got... You know, 16 million in self-quarantine in Italy. There's a lot of things God, he, he doesn't need to worry about little things like showing me love. But if it's true that nothing can separate us from the love of God, that it's an inseparable love, then right now, this very moment, God is loving you. It's an awesome thought. And it doesn't matter how busy or chaotic our world gets, his love for us doesn't waver doesn't lessen. Nothing can separate us from the love of God. Isn't that an invincible thought? That even though we can close down in-person church services and, and jobs and companies can close their doors, that nothing, nothing Satan manufactures, nothing we can experience on this life can separate us from the love of God. And then it continues, and it makes a list in verse 35, and the list is pretty much bad things. Tribulation. Shall tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, danger, or sword. Those are are rough words, right? Those are tough situations. In fact, in verse 36, it is literally talking about being martyred for your faith. So when he's talking about things separating us, he then lists about five or six of the most terrifying, large daunting realities we could face and he says these can't even do it these big terrible things can't they don't even these things don't even have the power to separate you from the love of god so he's pointing at the bad things and then he continues and he says verse 37 no in all these things we are more than conquerors in all what things well in tribulation distress persecution, famine, nakedness, in these things. So you could read the text to say, since, since nothing can separate me from the love of God, then that means if I hold on to God, I'm not going to have troubles. But it's deeper than that. What he's saying is, when tribulation comes, you can rejoice in knowing that even that terrible thing has no power to separate you from God's love. In all these things. What does it mean that we are more than conquerors? I'm not fully sure, 
but a conqueror would be one who faces a trial and overcomes. But to me, more than a conqueror would mean that not only do we face a trial and overcome, but we benefit by facing the trial. So to be more than a conqueror doesn't mean you just come out on the other side of this thing victorious, but in it, God did what he says in verse 28, he worked all things together for good to those who love God. And so to be more than a conqueror says, not only did I overcome, but I grew and my roots in Christ got deeper because of the trial. And then it says in verse 38, it lists some more things. And this time it's not just bad things. Before it was you know, tribulation and distress. But notice in verse 38 and 9, there are some good things and some neutral things. Um, it says neither death nor life. So death, would, we'd say that's a bad thing. Life, that's not a bad thing. Angels aren't necessarily bad things. And then it includes just everything. It says anything else in all creation. Which means, there in this list, there are things that attempt to separate us that are good things. Things that attempt to separate us that are neutral things. And so here's the opportunity we have in the situation we're in right now. Is that the good things in life and the normal rhythm and the normal, the normal process and schedule that we have that we thought was good, it's pretty much been taken away. Because it's not just bad things that separate us from God, but good things threaten our connection with God by lulling us into a comfort and making us feel okay that we can just naturally separate from God. And so we have an opportunity when everything has gone different and strange, we have an opportunity to say, well, everything else is changing at a rapid pace. Why not make some changes in my relationship with God? And so it's not just the bad things that attempt to separate us, it's the good things, and we have the opportunity now to say, those good things were deceiving me. And I'm going to reassess my life now that things are a little different. I'm going to look from a different perspective, and I'm going to insist on being inseparably connected with God, even if it means resisting the separation that all the good things pull at my heart with. And then he says, nothing in all creation can separate me from the love of God. I think of the fruits of the Spirit, love and joy and peace. He lists all these things, and then it says that there is no law against such things. It says, against such things, there is no law. What I understand that to mean the world can't give these things, the world can't take them away, and no man can legislate something that says you can't have God's love. You can't have God's joy. It goes right through prison doors, it goes right through self-quarantine. No one can say you can't have this because it's something God gives. And so there is no law against these things. I think of the image he gives through Paul where he says that he tears down the dividing wall. Anything that separates, God tears those walls down. So the, the reality that we're working off of in this series is the truth that separation is natural. But praise God that inseparable love is a supernatural reality. And so as you reflect on this message, um, there will be at 12.30, Saturday morning, Saturday afternoon, 12.30, there will be an opportunity to call in and have a time of fellowship. There are four conference calls, phone lines. We're going to put those numbers on the screen. And you can just visit, reflect on the service, um, pray together, encourage one another. And the thought I want you to reflect on, now we're going we're gonna to jump ahead in the series to all kinds of other thoughts about separation, but for right now, the thought that his love is with us right now is a pretty powerful thought. And so I want you to reflect on the, thought, the question, how are you experiencing inseparable love? What is it in the last week that you've experienced that has helped you to, to have God's inseparable love? Have you read a book? Have you watched a sermon? Have you been spending extra time in the scriptures? What is it that you are experiencing right now that you could testify and say, God's love is an inseparable love. It's with me right now in my situation I, I'm experiencing. And then to recognize that though separation is natural, because... God's love is an inseparable love. I'm able to say that I am convinced that we are more than conquerors through Christ Jesus who loves us. 
For I'm convinced that neither death, nor life, nor discouragement, nor loss of work, nor loss of income, nor loss of investments, nor sickness, nor isolation, nor traveled, canceled travel plans, nor canceled weddings, nor self-quarantine or self-pity, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And now let's worship that God of inseparable love in this closing song together. Father in heaven, I'm so grateful for inseparable love. There are people right this moment feeling quite separated. This week we felt disoriented. In fact, not even sure exactly what we're supposed to be doing. I pray you'd comfort each of our hearts right now, wherever we may be worshiping right now with the reality that you are present with us. You are loving us. No matter what we face, that doesn't change. I praise you that we can worship you in this format, and it's just as real of worship as if we were face-to-face -face with you. You are our only hope, and we hold on to you. We love you. I pray as we go through this time that you'd fill us with more of your love, that we could be more loving towards one another, able to serve one another, lift each other up, and that we could see the beauty of your church becoming what you've called us to be, attaining the fullness of the measure of Christ. 
Lord, for every stressed, anxious heart, for everyone experiencing loss and anxiety, we trust you with all of our emotions. Praise you for the Sabbath day where we can rest in you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.